You know, as a minister, I am sometimes asked the question, what is the meaning of life? Why are we here? Well, now you have the song that answers the question. I am here to give and receive love, to witness and honor that living spirit of truth within everyone, to see God in all people, to see God in the world, and to allow this living spirit of truth, the Christ we call it, to be seen as us. And in that seeing and in that knowing and in that experience, it shows up as some form of love. That's why last week I highlighted the difference between a hate group, and you read about those in the newspaper, and a love group. The love groups are the ones who are committed to doing the work of justice, to making sure that we are taking care of one another, to providing mercy in the world, to being the hands, the feet, the eyes, the ears, and the arms of God in the world to make a difference. And sometimes it seems like mission impossible, doesn't it? Anybody ever have that experience when you're looking at a situation, you're confronted with a situation in your life or in the world, and you think, how can I be the experience of love? How can I see love in this situation? It is truly mission impossible. Somebody I know knows about mission impossible and knows about unity, and that somebody was actor Greg Morris. How many of you remember the TV show Mission Impossible? It was in the last millennium, so it was a long time ago, 1966, 1973. Greg Morris played the character uh, Barney Collier. So don't take it from me. Let's hear what he has to say about it. The word is doing. Do you ever feel a deep sense of loneliness, alienation, or isolation? Many people do, and it is invariably caused by temporarily locking the door between ourselves and the world around us. The best way to quickly unlock the door is to go and do something. Take positive action that will bring a positive experience through doing something for another person, a group, an organization, or anything outside your individual self. It is literally a life-giving force to make a contribution beyond the narrow confines of self. For your free copy of Words from Unity, write Unity Television, Unity Village, Missouri, 64063. I'm Greg Morris, and remember, the word is doing. From the man himself, how do we make a difference? You know, I, I had selected this video clip and I didn't make in my mind the connection between our, connection, our partners with the American so uh, Society for the, what are you, who are you people? <laughs> you people, suicide prevention folks. Doing something, what are we doing in the world as individuals and as a movement to make a difference? This video clip, the word for the day, the word from unity, was the brainchild of Rosemary Fillmore Ray. Rosemary Fillmore Ray was the granddaughter of Unity co-founders Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. And they, she got this idea with that, that Unity should do five-minute television clips to have an inspirational message, to share about what unity was, and to make a difference in the world. Because those of you who were there remember the late 60s and early 70s, there was a lot going on. It was the Vietnam War, there was student protests, there was the women's movement, the emergent gay rights movement, civil rights movement, all kind, and, and political violence even. And in some respects, it very much mirrors the situations that we live with today. You can see some parallels, especially if you were there at Up Close and Personal. And she was thinking, how is it unity can shift the conversation? How can we make a difference? How can we inspire people to raise their vision and work for the betterment of everybody? How do we reach everybody? And she got this idea. Well, five minutes of radio and uh, television time is very expensive. And they didn't know how they could afford it. But then another divine idea came. What if we just did a one-minute inspirational, no real overtly religious context, and then the television stations could show it for free as a public service announcement. And that's what they did. 
They also realized that they could reach out to famous people, uh, actors and sports figures, and get them to offer to do a one-minute video clip. Why not? It's one minute. What harm can it do? And it came together perfectly. So what they did in this period from 1969 through 1973 was offered the, unity, the word from unity in a time when the nation needed it. It needs it today. But right now, it is up for you and me to be the word, to live the word, to express the word. And especially with, with uh, Mr. Morris's presentation today, that word was doing. It's not enough of just talk, it's do. You've just got to, as the songs say, do, do, do what must be done. It reminds me of our history in the unity movement. We have this history of being innovators and, and asking ourselves, how is it that we can reach everybody? And when the unity movement was founded in 1889, it began with the publication of a little magazine called Modern Thought in which all kinds of truth messages uh, about understanding the power of spirit within, the Christ within, and what, it can what impact it can have on our lives when we recognize that we are powerful beyond measure. And they went into publishing. And then rather than training ministers at first, the unity workers were trained as teachers. Go out and find a lecture hall. Teach. Teach people the truth. Teach them how to use the truth. And then in 1922, they went on the radio. Now remember, the, what, this new wireless thing didn't come out until 1920. Two years later, Unity was on the air because the founders of Unity, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, said, how can we reach everybody, not just somebody, not just the people we like, everybody. The message we have is too big to isolate. It must be for every man, woman, and child in the world. So they went on the radio and sure enough, when the idea came up, let's do television. Television is expensive. Well, so what? We'll find a way. They found a way. It reminds me of the evolution of the spread of the, the Jesus movement. And I call it that rather than the beginning of Christianity because the first person to really take Christianity or the message of Christ in you, your hope of glory, to a, a group larger than the very small number of Jewish people who heard Jesus was a man named Paul. Paul initially started out persecuting these folks but then had a revelatory experience and said, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you mean the kingdom of God includes everybody, like Jesus said? You mean everybody has the potential and the, the calling to let their light and their gifts shine? And it doesn't matter who they are, it doesn't matter what they believe or where they came from or, or their status in the world? No. And he said, I've got to do, do, do something about that. And so at great danger to himself, he went all around... The, metal, the Mediterranean area is spreading this message and establishing these communities of people. And so, so starting a new community, starting new work, I've pioneered a church, I can tell you how much fun that is. So starting a new work and introducing some new cons takes work, especially if it's not the common paradigm. And especially teaching a message of inclusivity of God's love. Well, you're going to get some pushback on that one because some people want to put God in our box only for us. We control. That's not how it works, folks. Of course, you're here in unity. You don't understand that. And so he wrote a letter to the community in Corinth. He wrote two of them that were famous. And in the second one, he's addressing various and sundry problems, you know, leadership from a distance, trying to address this issue and that issue, and provide a teaching, I always provide the spiritual teaching with the message. Every moment's a teachable moment. And in this second letter, he said, we have great confidence because we walk by faith and not by sight because we're willing to listen to the promptings of spirit and just do what we're called to do, even though it's never been done before. We're going to try something different. We're going to stretch. We're going to grow. We're going to be innovators. We're going to be, as we would say today, cultural creatives and entrepreneurs. We don't have to do it exactly how it's been done before because spirit is infinite. And there's an infinite number of ways that we can use to remind people of their inherent magnificence to help people understand the principles that will allow them to break free from any chain of limitation, externally imposed or internally imposed. For freedom, Christ has set us free. 
You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The message of liberation is all over the place. But it's not for just one group of people. It is for everyone. And that's what Paul worked to do, to make a difference in the world and invite everybody into an understanding of how they can make a difference. Now, we're talking about one guy. 2,000 years ago, one guy. And I sometimes think in, in, about our New Thought movement, about unity, Centers for Spiritual Living, Universal Foundation for Better Living, some of the other New Thought communities. And according to the Pew Research Center, we make up about three-tenths of one percent of the population in this country. That's an enormous number. We couldn't fit everybody in here. <laughs> Relative to the big picture, it's a pretty small number. And I sometimes look at the facts of the day, you, you see them too, and I think, what can we do about that? Seems kind of overwhelming. It like, seems like a tsunami of facts and alternative facts right behind it. It's like, what do we do? We do what must be done. I'm reminded of that famous quote by Margaret Mead, who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful people can change the world. Indeed. It's the only thing that ever has. And I remember what Paul said, we walk by faith and not by sight because we have great confidence. So that's where I'm at today as I think about what, what our new thought movement can do, what unity can do, what unity of Fairfax can do as a spiritual center for education, practice, and service. We have this wonderful vision statement here. We see the world awaken to peace, abundance, and respect for all creation. And that includes the green stuff creation, and the people creation, and the animal creation. And it may seem like there's all kinds of energy that, would, that is currently lined up against us. So we shall overcome it. We shall continue to speak the word and allow the word to become flesh through us in our doing and how we are making a difference and how we are supporting people who may be going through a hard time and how we are working for justice for people who are on the margins and being excluded. That's our work. And it doesn't matter if it's just two of us or 200,000 or 200 million. Nothing can stop us because the truth is unstoppable. The power of love is unstoppable. And the moral arc of history might be long, as Dr. King reminded us, but it bends towards justice. We're bending it. And we will, shall not be overcome. There's a wonderful story in a book called The Household of Faith by James Dillett Freeman, who's a unity writer. And he talks about a story about a man was giving a lecture one day, and the fire in the stove went out. So this was a long time ago. So this was before global warming. They couldn't just expect it to be hot. So, this, so the fire in the stove went out, and the man's giving the lecture, and so he steps down and gets some kindling, restarts the fire, all the while continuing with his message about, you know, whatever the message was about. And then he went back to the speaker platform and continued on as if nothing had happened. Well, that so inspired a young man who was in the audience that he volunteered to come back and keep coming back for several weeks or months or years, I'm not sure the time frame, to be the one who lit the fire. Fifty years after that initial experience, he wrote a letter to the leadership of Unity and said, I was that young man, and the speaker that day was Charles Fillmore, co-founder of the Unity movement. He lit a fire in me. And I was committed to light the fire for others. So that's what I ask us to think about today. And that's kind of our homework for this week. To think about what are the innovative ways that we can light the fire of truth so that it goes more from just a few sparks to a flame of hope and inspiration that will be inclusive that will support the consciousness of love, the transformation of consciousness from fear and lack in us and them and scarcity to the full realization and demonstration of the kingdom of God right here and right now. 
where everybody is valued and everybody is welcome and everybody has their needs met. We can do that. We are committed to doing that. We are doing that. And we shall not be overcome. Peace be with you and namaste.